Coast to Coast, direct from Austin. You're listening to the Alex Jones Broadcasting Network. Network. From his Central Texas Command Center, deep behind enemy lines, the information war continues. It's Alex Jones and the GCN Radio Network. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. It's Sunday, April 6, 2014. We're going to go to your calls here. I've got this clip from NBC in 2007 talking about what life was going to be like in 2017. An amazing clip, and I want to get your reactions to it, but we don't have that much time in this segment, so we're going to play it in the next segment. Let's go uh, to Chris in Kentucky, because we talked about concealed carry in Chicago earlier, and I, he had a, a comment about that. Chris, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dave. I lived in Chicago for many years up there since the 70s into the late 80s, and you're absolutely right. The more guns you take away, the more crime you have. It got worse in the 1980s when the gangs had, to, had just taken many districts of the cities and wondered why we need more police, we need more people to take more guns away from the law-abiding citizens. And guess what? It's been disastrous since. It's just as in New York City, another place. And it's getting to a point, I hope people wake up and realize the more guns you have in a city or a town, the less crime you have. You've documented that. It's that's, absolutely right. That's right. A couple weekends ago in Louisville, Kentucky, we had a bunch of teens that went on a rampage. A lot of people got injured. A lot of people were, were hospitalized. Well, how many of those people that had a concealed carry, if, those, if they would not have been robbed or their children hurt, you would have stopped that right instantly. The police cannot be there all everywhere at once. They always would rely on us. If you have your cell phone, oh, the government's going to be there or the police are going to be there to save you. No, that's not the case. You're going to have to defend yourself. It takes a split second before you can be killed in a crime, Dave. That's, is it, you're absolutely right. It's time that we've got to get all 50 states to conceal carry. This is our republic. We've got to take it back. Very, very true. You know, I've spoken many times to Jim Gearock. He's with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And uh, he pointed out he was a prosecutor in Chicago, in Cook County. And he said 80% of the shootings there are related to the war on drugs. They're gang-related. It's not because you've got too many guns in there. The, basically, they were essentially prohibiting guns from being in there, but they were still coming in in a massive amount. People were still shooting each other because criminals are still going to have those guns. It is a deterrent. It's something that people like the police chief in Detroit understand that, and hopefully we can get more people to understand it. It's a... It's a uh, information war, I think, to get people to understand that. Thank you so much, Chris in Kentucky. Let's go to uh, Mitchell in Louisiana. You wanted to say something about medications. Hey, David. Um, yeah, I wanted to say that I'm the second of three generations in my family that have been victims of the CPS in the United States. And when I was taken from my family, thankfully we were able to get my son out of the country before they actually got their clammy hands on him. But when I was in the system... Um, I was in a bunch of different foster homes and an adoptive home, and when I hit adolescence, as is far too normal in, uh, in that scene, when I hit adolescence, they dropped me like a wet rag, and I went into boys' homes and federal facilities for youths. Mm. And in my youth, in my teen years in these facilities, I witnessed just crimes against humanity is really the only way I can word it. And what they, they were experimenting on these children and me with these... Uh, psychotropic medications and over the years I've just seen so many children just begging to die just suffering suffering a lot of them weren't even crazy a lot of them did not have significant problems of any kind a lot of them were very somewhat intelligent children just struggling because of their family situation because the government had taken them from their homes and they were being put on all these hardcore psychotropic medications. Doctors from D.C. would fly in once a month and switch up the medications. They were constantly putting us on multiples, different kinds of medications all at the same time, taking us off, putting us on new ones. These kids were just seizing up, these totally would-be healthy children seizing up constantly, mm. creating all kinds of problems in their life. And it was the biggest insult to me, was after those years when I got out and I went on with my life. The biggest insult to me was the ignorance of the American people on average. And when I try to talk to my fellow countrymen about the crimes against humanity that I had to live through in my youth, my, my fellow American on average turns to me and they call me a liar. They tell me to shut up. That would never happen in the United States. That's impossible. And it's Mitchell, so we, have, we have heard your story over and over and over again from people. It is such a sad story. I know it's true. I have close friends 
who were foster parents and the kids that they were trying to help came to them with a long list of drugs that they had to give them. It's a very, very corrupt system. It's a very sad system. I'm so sorry you went through that. We're going to be right back. A chemical spill contaminating the water supply in nine West Virginia counties. This year alone, over 300,000 people in West Virginia had their drinking water contaminated. What are the health effects of having these drugs in our drinking water? It's forced medical treatment without the consent of residents. My friends, water filtration is one of the most basic actions you can take to protect you and your family from the harmful toxins and heavy metals in your tap water. On average, the county says it sprays with the glass. Glyphosate at least once a week. Few filters cut out the glyphosate that is found in water supplies worldwide. Remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, hydrofluorosilicic acid, sodium hexafluorosilicate. Fluoride it is in tea, it's in coffee, it's in water, it's in bread, it's in toothpaste. It is our responsibility to protect our families. The establishment's not going to do it. It's time to take action. It's time to filter our water. For a limited time, use the promo code WATER15 and get 15% off on all ProPure systems at Info store.com or call toll free 888 Hitler took the guns. Stalin took the guns. Mao took the guns. Fidel okay. Castro took the guns. Hugo Chavez took the guns. 1776 will commence again if you try to take our firearms. The Republic will rise again when you attempt to take our guns. I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. The answer to 1984 is 1776. You're listening to The Alex Jones Show. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight. And we've got some callers on the line at the bottom of the hour. Alex Jones is going to be joining us. We're going to have highlights of his interview with Ron Paul this last week. It's a very good interview. You're not going to want to miss it. They're going to talk about geopolitics, of course, the economy, what's going on in the Ukraine, and what Ron Paul thinks about the future of Rand Paul's presidential bid. If he's going to run for president, uh, and well, I won't go any further than that. We'll let you uh, listen to that at the bottom of the hour. That's going to be Alex Jones with Ron Paul. Now, just before we left in the last hour, we were talking about this piece that uh, Darren McBreen gave me about uh, NBC News talking about where they saw society in 10 years, in 2017. They did this back in 2007. And we all thought that this would be pretty interesting for you to see what they were telling us the world was going to be like and how much of this has come true. Let's take a look at that piece. More now of our special coverage here tonight, life in the U.S. in 10 years' time. By that time, there may be all kinds of new ways to safeguard and identify all those things that make each of us unique, our faces, even our fingerprints, even our eyes. Here now with more on the future of technology, NBC's Tom Costello. The year is 2017. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Science fiction 20 years ago, but a biometric reality today. The technology is based on answering one simple question. Am I who I say I am? Already, fingerprints and iris scans verify passenger identities at airports. Within 10 years, that technology may be even more widespread. And look for more complex facial recognition programs that scan a crowd of thousands looking for a single terrorist. Today's facial recognition software starts with the eyes, then it maps out the contours of the face and compares that against a database of millions, a database that's growing by the day. What's next? At the University of Bath in England, researchers predict big changes for consumers. I think it is possible to free us completely of our wallets and keys using biometric technology, if that's what people want in 10 years' time. In fact, it's already here. The latest home security locks use fingerprints to control deadbolts. And at the Jewel Osco grocery store in Chicago, some customers pay using their fingerprints. No paper or plastic. You don't really need anything other than your hand and your 
got that with you. So will future department stores scan our irises, like in the movie Minority Report, then offer products catered to who we are? Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. Experts say that technology is here now. The challenge is to safeguard our privacy in a brave new world. Tom Costello, NBC News, Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah, how are they doing about safeguarding our privacy in this brave new world? Not very good, are they? I thought it was interesting uh, that in 2017, this is before, of course, Obama was elected, they were already pushing the connection between biometrics and medical care. That was the very first thing you heard in that piece. Start out with an ambulance sound, the year is 2017, 10 years in the future. They, you don't have any ID, they don't know who you are, but hey, they've got this great microchip under your skin that tells them everything. Presumably, how they can bill you, right? <laughs> and uh, who you are, because that's really what they wanna know. What about your vaccination records? Are you current on that? Because then they can load you up with all the vaccines. But the real point of this is that this is not about helping people. This is about total information awareness, total control, a total surveillance grid. That's everything that they put out there. And of course, they roll that out to start getting people used to it. It's predictive programming. We already see most of that stuff there. As a matter of fact, it's already much, much worse than what they said, and we're not even to 2017 yet. I thought it was interesting that the guy they had on there, his name was uh, Clark Nelson, and he's with a company that is now turned into Morpho. It was uh, Sagem Morpho Biometrics at the time was how they uh, had the lower thirds on there. That is a French company. It's a biometrics company. It's the largest biometrics company in the world now. And what he said is, the key question is, am I who I say I am? And see, that's where the piece took a turn. They always like to say that this Orwellian technology, this brave new world technology is about helping you. All these robots that you see DARPA building, those are just going to help you in the case of an earthquake or a Fukushima event. No, they're there to hunt you down, okay? And this is why they're developing these biometrics. Am I who I say I am? Let's take a look at some of the stuff that this guy's company has done. They're number one in the world in biometrics. They've got 8,000 people, 40 countries, 85 subsidiaries, one and a half billion euros in revenue. They've got things like finger on the fly technology. It reads your fingerprints on a moving hand. You don't even have to hold your hand still. They can read it on the fly. They've got fast DNA matching tools. They're also specialists in border control. See, they've already started out, and you noticed in that they said it's going to move from the airlines. They were not doing fingerprints and iris scans at the airports in 2007, but they were priming everything to roll out from there with the TSA. But this is what Morpho also supplies. And again, this is just one of the many biometric companies. They happen to be the largest in the world. They have what they call secure biometric access control at borders, fully automated e-gates. And you can see that picture there. It's like a subway turnstile if you're looking at it. It's like a subway turnstile. You go in there, it looks at your biometric data, it looks at, compares it with your travel documents, compares it with your history. And they call it the Morpho way. Isn't that nice? Uh, they also have... Uh, multimodal fingerprints, where they look at your veins and other biometrics, as well as facial ID. And of course, these people also bring us the wonderful things like uh, red light cameras and speed limit enforcement. And they acquired 81% of GE Homeland Protection in 2009. See, that's where we're headed. This is all about what the state wants. This isn't what people want. You had one quote in there from a guy at the University of Bath. He said, I think it's possible for us to free ourselves completely of our wallets and keys using biometric technology if that's what people want in 10 years time. No, the people don't want that. The corporations want that. The governments that help the corporations, that feed the corporations want that as well. The government has its own little agenda there, but it's also part of it is feeding this giant surveillance state. That's where we're headed. It's not about your safety. It's not about safeguarding anything. If you haven't seen the new Captain America movie, you really need to see this. This guy took on the police state, the issues of our time, head on. Now, this is a story that was linked on Drudge Report from Mother's, Mother Jones. It says, Captain America, the Winter Soldier is about Obama's terror suspect kill list, says the film's directors. I'm not going to give you anything away. No spoilers here. But if you've seen the trailers, if you know anything about it, you know the general gist of it. And, and it was a deliberate thing, according to the directors. They said they wanted to make a political thriller. So, they, so we told them, well, if you want to make a political thriller, 
all the great political thrillers have current issues in them that reflect the anxieties of the audience. That gives it an immediate